all members in the debate are here. I'll simply move straight on. It's the next item of business is a debate on motion 23498 in the name of Joanne Lamont on an inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Joanne Lamont to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Convener, please. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee today about our inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland and its report, which we published in July. Before I go on to discuss our inquiry work in more detail, I would like to start by reflecting on the catalyst for this important piece of work for the committee. In December 2016, a public petition was lodged by Annette McKenzie, calling for consultation with and consent from a parent or guardian before prescribing medication to treat mental ill health if the patient is under 18 years of age. Ms McKenzie lodged her petition following the tragic death of her daughter Brittany from an overdose of prescription medication. Annette McKenzie has shown such courage in highlighting her concerns and she has done so in circumstances which no parent should ever have to face. And we know she continues to raise alarm about the scale of distress um, emerging amongst our young people and the desperate need for action. The committee took written and oral evidence on the petition from a wide range of individuals and organisations, including the Scottish Government, representatives from the medical profession and organisations which have a role in promoting and protecting children and young people. From this evidence, it was clear that there was strong support amongst key stakeholders that young people under the age of 18 should be able to give consent to treatment for themselves and that the principle of patient confidentiality should be protected. While there will be some who will hold a different view, as a committee, we respect the position that young people have a right to confidentiality when accessing medical advice and support. But we did note the importance of medical professionals highlighting to young people when prescribing for their distress, the importance of them seeking support from someone that they trust. The evidence the committee gathered while considering the petition also, however, raised serious concerns about the experiences of young people seeking help for their mental health, particularly when doing so for the first time. The evidence was compelling, and as a committee, it was clear we needed to explore this issue in greater detail. We therefore agreed to establish an inquiry to understand and suggest improvements on how young people feeling low and or anxious, particularly for the first time, can get the advice and support they need. The committee is grateful to all those who engaged with our inquiry and met with us. We are particularly proud that our work has been heavily influenced by the views of young people who are prepared to share their experiences of accessing mental health support services. To you all, I thank you for your bravery and your honesty. The evidence you gave was critical to our understanding and ultimately to our report recommendations. Throughout our report, we acknowledge that good work is being done across the country. We also absolutely recognise the desire and indeed the energy within government at all levels and among educational, healthcare and third sector organisations actively to improve the support that is available for young people. The committee was fortunate enough to see some of this work firsthand. It was evident from our engagement, however, that notwithstanding this desire and energy, many young people are struggling to find the help that they need. We heard examples of successful approaches, such as the whole system approach being applied in the Scottish borders and in North Ayrshire. Partnership working was highlighted throughout as key to providing good quality support to young people. Such a coordinated approach is not, however, the experience of young people in all parts of the country. We therefore believe that it is imperative that integration authorities and COSLA work together to identify areas of good practice and opportunities for agencies to work more closely together to develop specialist services. It was also clear from our evidence that there is a lack of information, or at least a lack of accessible information, for many young people, their families, and even those professionals seeking to support them about the services that are available. We therefore stress the need for a comprehensive mapping of the range of services being offered in communities. This would ensure a more effective network of services while also creating an opportunity for gaps in support to be identified and addressed. It is crucial that the information is available, accessible and actively promoted to young people and relevant professionals. To achieve this, we urge the Scottish Government to set out the minimum level of Tier 1 service provision that should be available locally and to work with integration authorities to provide clear pathways to support services. 
We also recommend that integration authorities take an inventory of all the services supporting young people's mental health to build an accurate picture of the provision available locally. This information then needs to be shared widely. Um, although we recognise that some integration authorities have already done this, it's clear that not all have. Parents and carers sharing their experience and knowledge with us have expressed how desperately they have tried to support their children as the best they can. In many cases, however, they too are struggling. Alongside information and advice to help them to identify the signs and know who to turn to when mental health issues arise, we recognise that parents may also need support themselves. As a result, we recommend that the Scottish Government Commission work to identify how best to support parents and carers to access information about their children's mental health and signpost them to access the right services. There has been much scrutiny across the Parliament of the Scottish Government's commitment to ensure that every secondary school has access to counselling services. While the committee welcomes this commitment, we note that counselling alone will not address the needs of young people and can therefore only ever be one part of a package of measures. We also recognise the successes that a number of local authorities have achieved using programmes which focus on early intervention and resilience. It is imperative that consideration is given to how counselling services can complement these approaches. Given the limitations of this policy in isolation and the considerable costs involved, we believe that the Scottish Government should be ready to reallocate the spending if it appears that schools counselling is not delivering the desired outcomes and there are other interventions that may be effective instead. We therefore recommend that the Scottish Government works with COSLA to review the extent to which this policy is delivering its intended objectives while achieving best value with the resources available. Such a review should be reported to Parliament by early 2022. We began this work, of course, prior to the coronavirus, but we considered our final report during lockdown. So it was already becoming clear how much the COVID-19 pandemic was having an impact on everyone's lives, none more so than young people. The impact of issues like homeschooling, cancelled exams, and training and employment press prospects has been clear. The wider impact on mental health remains to be seen. We can only look into the future and dread. We acknowledge that the Scottish Government has allocated additional resources for mental health services. We do not yet know, however, the full consequences of the pandemic. More work will be required in the longer term to monitor, identify and address the significant challenges facing young people. We also highlight that a clear role exists for all employers in Scotland. While many employers recognise their duty of care to their employees, there is more to do to ensure that good practice is shared among all employers. We therefore advocate that employers ensure there is suitable mental health training for members of staff with line management and or human resources responsibilities. Another key theme in our report is the need properly to equip those who are working with children and young people with skills and knowledge so they can identify and support children who are struggling. We also firmly believe that a young person should be able to choose in whom they wish to confide. Whether a teacher or member of school staff, a GP or youth worker, there should be training available to ensure that people in these roles can support young people. As a consequence, we recommend that the Scottish Government work with relevant partners to develop an online mental health first aid training course for all people who work with children and young people. Although the committee does not consider that this training should be mandatory, it suggests that the Scottish Government take steps to ensure this course is easily accessible to all those who want it. Given the amount of time that the children and young people spend in school, we recognise that for many young people, a teacher would be their chosen trusted adult. We therefore believe that it is essential that teachers are equipped with the confidence to identify and support young people with their mental health. To achieve this, we recommend that Education Scotland ensures that mental health first aid training is included in initial teacher education by the start of academic year 21-22. We also recommend that regional improvement collaboratives identify the availability of continuing professional development for teachers in relation to supporting young people's mental health. The committee would like again to acknowledge the hard work of all those supporting young people and seeking to improve the services that they can access. The people that we met were passionate about helping young people and eager that they and the young people they are working with have the support they require. I would also like to thank all committee members, past and present, the clerks, um, and others for their work throughout the inquiry and during the consideration of our report. And finally, to Annette McKenzie. While I recognise that she has not got the change she asked for, she has prompted a really important conversation and consideration in Parliament about the support available to young people for their mental health. 
which I hope she will see during our debate today. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Ms. Lamont. I now call in Claire Hockey to open the Scottish Government Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Public Petitions Committee for looking into this important issue, and I'm pleased to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government. The issues that the Public Petitions Committee have raised are critical. Following the Committee's final report on their inquiry, I wrote to them with the Scottish Government's response to key recommendations that were made, and I would like to take some time to summarise our response to these recommendations. The report made recommendations relating to local mental health support and service availability, ensuring that appropriate guidance and pathways are in place for children and young people. We are working closely with local authorities to support them to develop new community mental health and wellbeing services. And last month, we announced a further £15 million to respond to children and young people's mental health and wellbeing issues, building on our previous investment. This funding has been allocated to local authorities to support local response for 5 to 24-year-olds, their families and carers. In addition to this, in March, we provided local authorities with a framework on how community mental health supports and services should be provided. And this framework aims to set out a clear, broad approach for the support that should be available to children and young people within their communities, assist local children's services and community planning partnerships with the commissioning and establishment of new services or supports, or the development of existing services and supports, and facilitate the enhancement or creation of services that can deliver support which is additional and innovative wherever these are best placed. One of the recommendations focuses, on, uh, focuses around support for parents and carers of those experiencing mental health issues. And we are working across sectors to ensure that there is a wide range of information and support available for families when needed. For example, through our Parent Club website, which offers guidance on children's mental health, and uh, Solihull, the online parenting support, uh, can also be accessed through that. We are investing £240,000 in Solihull online to provide additional support during pandemic restrictions and into the next phase of recovering from and exiting restrictions. Increasing public awareness was also raised by the committee. As members will know, Clear Your Head is a national campaign that was launched on the 21st of April to help support people cope during the pandemic. The campaign and associated website highlights the practical things that people can do to help them feel better and to cope with the restrictions during the pandemic. And this includes young people. But specifically for young people, we have worked with Young Scott to develop I Feel, a resource encouraging young people to look after their emotional well-being alongside providing key advice and signposting. On the committee's recommendation regarding support and employment, we've committed to delivering the Young Persons Guarantee so that every person aged between 16 and 24 will have the opportunity to study, take up an apprenticeship, job or work experience, or to participate in formal volunteering. And we've also committed to working with employer groups and trade unions to promote mentally healthy workplaces. The report recommended further work to review the provision of school counsellors and we are on course to invest over £60 million so that every high school has access to counselling. As part of the joint agreement with COSLA and local authorities in this commitment, the Scottish Government has agreed a reporting form to understand progress and measure outcomes for those who access a counsellor via their secondary school. And lastly, the committee recommended that online mental health first aid training for people working with children and young people is developed. And I'm pleased to say we're developing an online open access professional learning resource in mental health and wellbeing for all school staff across primary and secondary education in Scotland. And it's expected that this training will be available by spring 2021. And this is in addition to previous mental health first aid training and the mental health and schools working group resources to support mental wellbeing, which has been available since June 2020. With a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic, on October the 8th, I set out the government's response to the mental health challenges of COVID-19 through our new transition and recovery plan. 
And in this, we laid out a range of actions to respond to the needs of our young citizens, including emotional wellbeing, support available in education settings, and pathways into specialist mental health services. Alongside this plan, we've put in place additional support measures further to those I've already mentioned, such as enhanced digital resources on mental health and wellbeing, and the expansion of the Distress, Distress Brief Intervention Programme, which supports people presenting to frontline services in distress, and is now available nationally to those above the age of 16. In particular, on the 6th of November, we announced £1.32 million of additional funding to support students with the mental health impacts of the pandemic. And I extend my thanks to the students of Scotland who have dealt with substantial challenges over the last three months. Despite these positive developments, as today's published child and adolescent mental health services waiting time statistics show, there is still work to be done. It is encouraging to see more children and young people starting their mental health treatment sooner. But as demand increases and continues to increase, we know that some people are still having to wait too long for treatment. And we recognise that long waits are unacceptable and remain committed to meet the standard that 90% of patients are seen within 18 weeks. A number of boards have focused on those children and young people who have been waiting the longest, and this concerted effort to address backlogs have pushed down the proportion being seen who have been waiting for less than 18 weeks. Notably, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has more than doubled its capacity to see new patients over this time and reduced the CAMS waiting list by over 1,000 since the end of March 2020. Several further boards, including NHS Grampian and NHS Tayside, also made significant progress meeting demand for CAMS and are now in a good position to meet the standard in future. While these long waiting time reduction initiatives necessarily impact on the performance standard, I welcome that increasing numbers of children and young people who have been waiting are now receiving treatment under CAMS care, despite the obvious operational difficulties caused by COVID-19. However, in a number of boards, the proportion of people waiting longer than 18 weeks has gone up over this time. And that's why Scottish Government is dire uh, directing enhanced improvement support to these boards not on track to meet the standard. In our transition and recovery plan published on October the 8th, we set out a number of actions to progress improvement on access to CAMS, including the implementation of our CAMS service specification and a tailored support programme uh, for NHS boards to improve their waiting times performance and address unacceptably long waits. And we will work with mental health leads in these boards to develop and implement recovery plans by the end of March 2021. Despite the constraints caused by the pandemic, health boards have responded creatively and many have made significant progress. And we've been working closely with all boards to plan the recovery of CAMS across Scotland and to help individual NHS boards respond effectively to the anticipated increase in demand in the months ahead. Members will also be aware that on the 24th of October, annual suicide statistics for Scotland were published. We continue to prioritise our work on suicide prevention through our Suicide Prevention Action Plan and the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. Every one of these lives lost was a tragedy. And my heartfelt sympathies go to those who have been bereaved by suicide. Presiding Officer, I would also like to recognise the efforts of our mental health workforce through this pandemic. Mental health workers have worked tirelessly throughout supporting children, young people and families. And without these workers, there would be many more people not receiving the support that they, they require. Thank you for everything that you do to ensure mental health is seen as a top priority across Scotland. The adversities faced through COVID-19 have shown a critical light on the importance of good mental health. Whilst it has been a very difficult time for everyone, I'm grateful that mental health is now being spoken about far more openly and is at the forefront of everyone's mind exactly where it should be. Thank you. I had a little time in hand and I still have some, so I'll say to our opening speakers, if you go slightly over, because the, the minister did, that's OK by me, but don't over-egg it, that's the thing. <laughs> I, call, I call on Brian Whittle to open the Conservatives. Mr Whittle, please. As if I would, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by declaring that I have a daughter who is uh, Head of Guidance in a, in a secondary school. I am glad to have the opportunity uh, to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives because, Deputy Presiding Officer, my time in this place is done. One of the biggest things that will go with me uh, as a memory is the first time that Annette McKenzie appeared in front of the Petitions Committee with an incredible bravery 
and a quiet dignity spoke about the tragic death of her 16-year-old daughter. And I remember her being terrified to just be sitting in front of parliamentarians and the cameras as she was driven out of a sense of need, a need to try and prevent what happened to her ever happening again. And as the convener has said, Ms Mackenzie's daughter presented at her GP surgery with anxiety symptoms, was prescribed medication a full month's worth and died having taken an overdose of that prescription medicine. Now, her simple ask was that a parent and a guardian should know of such a diagnosis and prescription. In her words, she said if she had known, she would have been able to ensure that her daughter took the prescription medication and the doses required. Now, under the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991, a person under the age of 16 has the legal capacity co to consent to any medical procedure or treatment where, in the opinion of a qualified medical practitioner, they understand the nature and possible consequences of the procedure or treatment. Now, that got me thinking about the capacity of a young person, or anyone for that matter, presenting at a GP with poor mental health and their potential capacity to make rational decisions. Now, I've got to say, as the convener will tell you, I've pushed this point throughout the inquiry. Surely the very nature of poor mental health must bring this into question. And I've got to say, I can't accept the blanket answer of the patient-doctor confidentiality. That is a cop-out to me. And asking the question, I'm asking the question, have we got the balance wrong? I, I see that we have, and I think the medical profession must take a... Uh, take of course. Stuart yes. Stevenson. Um, while I understand exactly what the member is saying, and I don't rebut it, will he also accept that being in mental ill health does not prevent one from being able to take a positive engagement with what happens to them? Brian Whittle. Can I thank Mr Stevenson uh, for that intervention. What I was going to come on to say actually was it's a complicated issue and it's not straightforward and I'm not suggesting I have an answer. What I want, what I want to see out the back of this inquiry is the medical profession to take another look at this, to see whether, whether we can change the way in which uh, or massage the way in which uh, this legislation was first brought in to try and, uh, uh, try and help people like uh, Annette McKenzie. I think this debate is related directly to the Health and Sport Committee's debate last week, where we debated the medicine inquiry. And I, I said in that debate that I thought there was an overprescription of drugs to tackle anxiety, more often than not because the medical practitioners limited treatment options, their lack of the appropriate time to spend with a patient and make a full assessment of need. That, in turn, should be linked, in my opinion, to other inquiries, such as the social prescribing inquiry, to, inquiry that was done by the Health and Sport Committee. Because I have to say, I don't think the current plan is was working particularly well. But the subsequent inquiry into children mental health support gathered a worrying level of evidence highlighting serious concerns about the experiences of young people seeking help for their mental health. Now, we do know how much CAMS was under pressure prior to the COVID crisis, with, a th with thousands of children waiting more than 18 weeks, waiting time, the 18 weeks waiting time target set by the government over a third of cases, according to the latest figures from Public Health Scotland. There are now more than 1,000 children and young people who have waited more than a year for mental health treatment. Yet we know that early intervention is the key. During COVID, referrals for young people have dropped by more than half at a time when we know that mental health issues are rising steeply. Now, that should set alarm bells ringing. Recent, uh, recently released statistics show a sharp increase in suicides in the year prior to COVID, and we have the continuing rising numbers of drug-related deaths, which is three times the rate of the rest of the UK, which is often associated with childhood trauma. So we should all be concerned about what is coming when this year's figures are announced. And I would like to see the Scottish Government have a plan now to look at what is coming. The role of the third sector and, indeed, the school environment, I think, are crucial in this matter because they offer options to those suffering in a non-medical environment. It's somewhat ironic, I think, that we follow a debate on valuing the third sector to my mind, they are grossly underappreciated and underfunded. There has to be a better integration of mental health service between the NHS and the third sector. And there are examples where this works well and is very effective, and we need to replicate that across the country. Now, Joanne Lamont and I had an impromptu discussion uh, recently around the importance of keeping sport accessible to our children and young people. I realise that's your reputation destroyed now. But that was hugely important before COVID. 
Now it is absolutely essential. Any parent, me included, who has children who participate and had that option taken away during COVID will know exactly what I'm talking about. That prevention is better than cure. Presenting officer, I'll finish where I started. Given Ms McKenzie's long campaign of four years now, the support she has galvanised over that time for her petition and the hugely important issues she raises, this Parliament owes her and all those who have children suffering from poor mental health full consideration of the issues the petition raises. In all that time, I have to ask what really has changed? And I think the answer to that is very little. I think it's the most damning thing about this Parliament after a full political term, with everything, everyone gearing up for an upcoming election, that issues such as this, that really matter, are still going properly unaddressed. Well, the Petitions Committee has done its job. And for me, I want to thank all the clerks and staff, as well as my colleagues, for taking a huge issue and delivering such a comprehensive report. The Scottish Government have to say, I've, I've talked long, but I think I've come up really short with definitive action. Well, you know now they have a committee report to galvanise you into action. This is beyond petty politics. With all the political manoeuvrings and attempts to get one over each other, surely there has to be room for this issue to be properly addressed. Otherwise, what are we doing here? So I urge the Scottish Government to take a breath, take stock of the Petitions Committee's report and work across this chamber to develop a strategy and a plan to support our children and young people into good mental health. Now more than ever, in these times, it is crucial. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. And I call on Mary Fee to open for Labour. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On, on behalf of Scottish Labour, I welcome the Committee's report. And we agree that mental health provision for young people in Scotland is complex and fragmented. And it is for these reasons that I welcome the conclusions and the recommendations that have been offered by the Public Petitions Committee. And before I progress, Presiding Officer, I want to thank the many organisations and young people who voiced their concerns and spoke of their experiences around mental health services for young people. And I also want to thank Annette McKenzie for lodging the petition that led to the inquiry. It would have been incredibly difficult for Mrs. M Ms. McKenzie to talk about her experience and the tragic loss of her daughter. And as other speakers have done in their opening remarks, can I too praise Annette McKenzie for the incredible strength and commitment she has shown in raising what would have been an extremely personal but extremely important issue, which has led to us debating this today. Can I also thank the committee members and clerks for their work in recent months to produce this report? And, presiding officer, any investment in mental health services for children and young people is welcome. However, it is crucial that the investment is adequate, and that is something we have not seen by this government. And I know that the government has invested in mental health services across the population in recent months since this report has been published. And the committee has welcomed the additional funding in response to the pandemic. Yet it rightly pointed out that calls for the expansion of these services existed before the COVID-19 public health emergency. And the pandemic has exposed further the mental health crisis that existed before. And many young people will feel even more isolated than they have been, particularly our students. And in the first wave of the virus, we witnessed a sharp drop in referrals to CAMS. And the continuing high rate of rejected referrals shows that hundreds of young people remain without the support they need at the, at the time they so urgently need it. And today's CAM statistics for June to September 2020 show that CAMS referrals have increased again, but rejected referrals remain at a steady level. And of the 9,699 children and young people left waiting at the month end, it's shocking that over half, over half are waiting longer than 18 weeks and almost 1,000 young people have been waiting over a year. And what is required going forward 
is more connected work on mental health services for young people and effective through care from CAMS to the transition to adult services. And the expansion of mental health counsellors is welcome and something that we on labour benches have called for. However, it is not a single solution and must be part of a collection of services, all working alongside one another. However, the difference of what it is on offer compared to what must be on offer is stark. And recruitment and training play a part in the challenges faced to support young people's mental health, as highlighted by Stuart Valentine, who is the Chief Executive of Relationship Scotland, who stated, there are not enough qualified children and young people's counsellors to fulfil the commitment. And Mr Valentine was referring to the commitment to have counsellors in all secondary schools by September of this year. And obviously the pandemic will have played its part this year in whether or not the government has achieved this ambition. However, I would be grateful for the Minister for Mental Health if she could update the Chamber how successful meeting this deadline has been. And, presiding officer, schools have a strong part to play in supporting the mental health of young people. And further tools at our disposal are mental health first aid training for all school staff and senior pupils. And a key aspect of this training must be to identify and signpost services. And a crucial theme of the committee's report was the lack of signposting and knowing where to seek further support. And an issue raised by parents and carers to the community. Parents and carers need support to be able to support young people. And one parent in the digital consultation said, if there was common knowledge and education available for parents, then I feel we as parents could help more and make a start on the healing process. And, presiding officer, the inquiry stemmed from the petition that raised concerns of medication prescribed to young people. In certain cases, medication has a role to play in the poor mental health of anyone at any given time. But medication should only be the start of the recovery, rarely a long term solution and it should be given alongside other services. And we agree that early interventions and better training and resources for teachers are key to helping them to be able to support young people. And finally, presiding officer, I hope that the government take on board the conclusion and recommendations from the committee's report. And it is important more than ever before that mental health services are properly funded and properly signposted. And schools are an important part in the mix of mental health support and through care to adult services. But they cannot be the cliff face that many young people face and have faced in the past. This pandemic has worsened mental health across the population, and we cannot leave a generation of young people behind as we rebuild. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mental health is a subject that should be a permanent fixture for debate in this chamber. Because, as Scottish Liberal Democrats pointed out in our opposition debate a year ago, there is a mental health crisis in Scotland. So I am grateful to the Public Petitions Committee for producing this report, and I am grateful to the petitioner, Annette Mackenzie, and pay tribute to her for putting forward the petition that inspired this body of work in 2016. This latest report adds to the mountain of evidence that already exists to show that Scotland has its work cut out to put together an effective system capable of looking after the mental health and well-being of children and young people. That has only become more obvious during the course of the pandemic. As the committee point out, 
it has been reported that 9% of 18 to 24-year-olds across the UK have lost their jobs altogether, which is the highest figure out of all age groups. As a member of the Education Committee, I have also seen the challenges to mental health and well-being that have been created by the waves of disruption to young people's education. School closures, cancelled exams, and all the uncertainties around higher and further education restarts have created a perfect storm for anxiety and isolation. In evidence to the Education Committee earlier this year, EIS General Secretary Larry Flanagan said that there will be, quote, an increasing number of children who have been severely traumatised, unquote, as a result of the coronavirus crisis. It is blatantly clear that with the current workforce levels, the system cannot cope. Too many young people are waiting too long for mental health treatment. Once again, Scottish Government figures released today show well over a thousand waiting over a year. It's heartbreaking to see many more children now struggle at the back of one of the longest queues in the entire health service. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. As Sam H. point out in their briefing, some children and young people are rejected from CAMS after a paper-based referral without any in-person contact. Problems that may start as something small become worse. And too often, as a consequence of that wait, comes tragedy. These waiting times are not just numbers that don't add up. They are evidence of individuals who have reached out only to find that the support they need just isn't there. For someone who is at their most vulnerable, that realisation must be crushing. Presiding officer, I want to use my remaining time to speak about an issue that has also had the attention of the Education Committee in recent months, school councillors. Because there were issues highlighted in evidence to the Public Commission Petitions Committee that chimed with my own reflections. One contributor to a Petitions Committee roundtable stated, school-based counselling services are essential to ensure this help is available at the earliest opportunity. I agree, and on that basis, I was troubled by evidence that the Education Committee heard in the autumn. That evidence showed a fragmented system. There was no quality assurance, no coordination, no profile of demand. When asked for those details, those giving evidence reverted to CAM's figures. But as Sam H have pointed out, people feel like they need to be in crisis in order to access CAMS. There are large numbers of people who need support, but don't fall into that category. If the Scottish Government doesn't take immediate and material action, that's only going to get worse. It requires more boots on the ground and a coherent and accountable system in place to back them up. That means building the workforce and making sure those who work in the frontline roles like teaching are given the training they need to process and understand the issues and children and young people are facing. MH research found that 66% of teachers feel like they haven't had enough mental health training to do their job properly. Worryingly, that is more likely to be the case for those who have qualified in the last five years. They have called for the Scottish Government and Education Scotland to take measures to protect time for training in mental health for all school staff. The Scottish Mental Health First Aid Programme has paused its face-to-face -face training because of the pandemic. Since May, Scottish Liberal Democrats have called on the Scottish Government to restart that work. Because by failing to provide these basic interventions, we make everything so much worse. Too often, government spending focuses money on reactionary policies that only try to fix problems when they have already reached this point. On that basis, I support the committee's findings today. Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate. And I call David Torrance to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to offer my thanks to Clarks and Spice, as well as my fellow committee members, for their hard work in contributing to inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland report. I'd also like to give thanks to everyone who contributed to this inquiry 
by giving evidence, both written and oral, to committee. We are fortunate to hear from a wide range of charities and stakeholders, including Penumbra, Scottish Association for Mental Health, Children in Scotland, representatives from the medical profession and many other organisations. Importantly, we also heard from individuals about their own personal experiences of the support they received for their mental health and would like to thank them for sharing their stories with us. As others have, I would like to begin by noting my thanks and appreciation to Annette McKenzie. In December 2016, Ms McKenzie lodged a public petition calling for a consultation with and a consent from a parent or guardian before prescribing medication to treat mental ill health if a patient is under 18 years of age. Ms McKenzie lodged her petition following the tragic death of her daughter, Brittany, from an overdose of prescription medication. I am grateful to, to Ms McKenzie for her courage in highlighting these concerns to the committee, which has brought us to where we are today. Mental health influences how we think and feel about ourselves and others and how we interact at events. It affects our capacity to learn, to communicate and to form sustain and end relationships. It also influences our ability to cope with change, transitions and life events. Good mental health allows children and young people to develop the resilience to cope with whatever life throws at them and grow into well-rounded healthy adults. The central purpose of the child and adolescent mental health services is to develop and deliver services for those children and young people their parents and carers who are experiencing the most serious mental health problems. They also have an important role in supporting the mental health capability of the wider ne network of children's services. Delivery of good quality CAMS is vital to, and relies upon adequate numbers of well-trained staff being recruited and retrained across NHS Scotland. Over the last de decade, we have seen the number of people working in child and adolescent mental health services increase by over 50%. An investment of 58 million over four years is helping boards improve access to CAMS and psychological therapies through workforce development, recruitment and retention and service improvement support. Timely access to health care is a key measure of quality that applies equally in respect to access to mental health services. We know that early action is more likely to result in full recovery and in the case of children and young people, we will also minimise the impact that aspects of their development such as their education, so improving their wider social development outcomes. Figures show that by the time they're 16, three children in every classroom will have experienced a mental health problem, and a worrying 74% of young people do not know what mental health information support and services are available in their local area. When we have a problem, our physical health, we all know where to turn and what we need to do, but when our mental health becomes unwell, it's often be hard to know where to turn to. For our young people, it is vital that they know what support is out there and how we can access it. Similarly, people who have a role in supporting young people must also have an awareness of the services and support that exists. During our evidence session, it became clear and it can be confusing and cluttered landscape for young people seeking help for their mental health and for people trying to help them. Whilst the range of services available to support young people seeking help for their mental health in the public, private and first sector, we must continue to improve upon how we distribute not only a message but information about the avenues of first support available for young people, their families and friends, as well as their professionals supporting them. I very much welcome the actions of this government to ensure that children and young people receive the support they need in the earliest possible stage. Support such as the 60 million that is guaranteeing every high school has access to school counselling services available and the delivery of 80 additional counsellors in further and higher education. During the committee's engagement events with young people, several of them highlighted how helpful it was to have access to a counsellor or mental health professional in their school. Similarly, the benefits of school counsellors were highlighted to the committee by several teachers. It was hugely encouraging to hear firsthand the feedback from pupils and teachers about these services and role of play as a part of a wider range of measures. The establishment of a mental health in schools working group is also a welcome step forward in the government's ongoing commitment to support the positive mental health in children and young people in school, and whose remit includes supporting the development of professional learning resources for all school staff, which will provide essential learning required to support children and young people's mental health and well-being. It is accepted that mental health support for young people was a challenging area for public policy, even before the considerable impact of COVID-19. It has therefore never been more important for young people to be aware of their mental health and the steps they can take to protect it and the services that are available for those who need it. It has been expected that school closures, cancelled exams and general uncertainty regarding the future are likely to lead to an increased anxiety in young people 
A top of water is often already a stressful time in a young person's life. Given the scale of impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, good practice must exist across all local levels and we focus must be given to int intervention and prevention. The Scottish Government's 10-year mental health strategy set out a commitment to create a Scotland where all stigma and discrimination related to mental health is challenged and a collective understanding of how to prevent and treat mental health problems is increased. A nation where mental health care is personally centred and recognised life-changing benefits of fast, effective treatment, and a Scotland where we can act on the knowledge that failing to recognise, prioritise and treat mental health problems costs not only our economy, but harms individuals and communities. We have certainly made progress with the 2019 annual report, showing that of all 29 recommendations of audit of rejected referrals to CAMS and the development of 19 of the 40 actions of mental health strategy. In conclusion, presiding officer, Mental health is an integral part of a public health, and it is important as physical health to the overall being of individuals, communities and societies. The events of recent months have shown just how important it is our children and young people have the emotion resilience to adapt to social pressures, challenges and changes in circumstances. I welcome the recommendations of the report response from the Scottish Government and look forward to the progress of our mental health strategy as we continue to advance the development of services and information to ensure that no child our young person is left behind. Thank you. I now call Tom Mason to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This report and the, and the, and the, uh, this debate and the report that underpins it comes as a vital inflection point as we look on at ways to improve access to mental health care for young people. I joined the committee at the end of, the, end of its work on this report which may have been helpful as it provided a fresh look at some of the issues. The latest data suggests that there have been decreases in children and young people starting treatment, nearly 40% not being seen within an 18-week target. Some of the longest mental health waiting times on record and an extensive backlog of cases to be taken forward. So, uh, that, is, so that is the backdrop. And we have to consider when looking to improve the care provided to these young people. These declines are during extraordinary circumstances, of course. I do not doubt, and, and doubt the will of all involved to make things better. However, the issues with CAMS waiting times predated the pandemic. So there is need to look beyond the events of this year to understand the changes that are needed going forward. The committee's work has raised a number of issues, particularly challenges in improving early intervention and prevention. This is the key, and the recommendations to set out the minimum levels of service provision in local areas and publishing clear pathways to support young people are vital in ensuring that the available support is at the high, high enough level to treat all who need it. In her response to the committee, the Minister set out the actions that the Scottish Government is taking to meet these challenges, and in particular referring to two million of new funding and the framework for local authorities that was issued in March this year. However, a lot has happened in the intervening period. With that in mind, I wonder if the Minister could set out whether she believes this is sufficient for the problems that have arisen since, and if not, what further support the Scottish Government put in place to ensure that the commitment to the committee is kept. Yes. I thank the member for taking her intervention. Then, uh, Mr Mason will be aware that um, last month we um, increased funding to local authorities so that they could put in a direct response to the effects of the mental health challenges for children and young people. I mentioned that in my speech. I take it he welcomes that commitment. John Mason. Well, thank you for that, and I'm sure, sure people understand that. The committee also identified issues with the provision of school counsellors and whether the current level is sufficient for the performance needed. School counsellors are a vital part of any mental strategy for children, as they can be the first to witness potential problems, long before young persons might discuss issues with a doctor or seek referral to a treatment. I'm conscious that they there are many different pressures affecting our young people, including physical welfare, the perception of body image and the dietary problems. We should also recognise that these have been become apparent, more apparent in recent years and may have developed alongside declining family, family stability 
and the growth of social media. And we must recognise the impact that both have had, had on young persons' well-being. And as such, they should be part of the solution. The committee has asked for the government to work with COSNA to fully review the provision, provision of councillors. And although the minister has said she is currently working with COSNA on mental health support, a, a commitment to reporting to Parliament on this specific issue by early 2022 too, should be very reassuring. Deputy Presiding Officer, the availability of mental health support to children and young people is vitally important at the best of times. Never mind during a pandemic that has seen, seen focus, understandably drawn to, to other areas. It is my hope that this report and the recommendation it contains will help those in government improve the quality of care for young people. So that if someone is struggling with their mental health, the support is available to them, regardless of where or how old they might be. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking Joanne Laman and the committee for bringing this crucially important debate to the Parliament. Young adults have been especially badly hit during the pandemic with a triple whammy of curtailed education, diminished job prospects and reduced social contact with peers. It's quite heartbreaking in many ways. And young people who have been shielding during the pandemic have an especially tough time as it's impacted on their jobs. For many, it's affected their ability to socialise with people after lockdown. The ONS tells us that young people who reported that their wellbeing was being affected were much more likely than those over 30 to report that the lockdown was making their mental health worse. That period between the ages of 18 and 24 is a time of especially high risk of experiencing a mental health problem. Three quarters of mental health problems arise before your mid-twenties. I want to firstly recognise the dedication of Minister Claire Hawkey on mental health support. But I also want to plead with her too that the current system is not fit for purpose. What I see on paper looks fine, but the reality is not, and I know this from bitter experience. A young woman I know made an attempt in her life recently following two failed requests to her GP for support. And after several weeks, no action was taken. It seemed to be an argument between the Rossdale Unit in Glasgow and the Wellbeing Service as to which was the right service. But after six, six weeks, she was sent a letter, the wording of which I find astonishing. If you would like to opt into this service, you have five days, and after that, you will be removed from the list. She was, of course, removed from the list as she was unable to cope with life, but she was very angry at that letter. Now, this young woman is underweight and fragile, but not through an eating disorder because of other health issues, difficulty holding them a job, and affecting her relationships. But what she needed was to talk to someone swiftly as soon as she left hospital and to feel that the service was there for her. And I can assure you, she did not think that. The delays and the lack of serious treatment have only added to her problems. She is wondering why no one seems to care. A week ago, three months after, she risked her own life, which is a clear cry for help, in my opinion. She's had one phone call, and she now has to wait for a further two months to be told if any action will be taken, or indeed if there will be a diagnosis. In contrast, another young woman in Glasgow in the same health ward was referred only two weeks ago and has already had a video appointment and has been referred to Rothdale House after a request to her GP. And my questions are, why is video not standard across the board? Why is the follow-on so slow? What is the service opt-in all about? Does that really help struggling young people? And why is it that someone who made an attempt on their own life is still waiting for help, but someone else in the same authority um, ask for help through a GP. I mean, this disparity is not acceptable. How many more young people will suffer because the service is presumably so under strain that it's months between the first assessment and the outcome? Why is there such a lottery with one health board? Mental health illness is only going to get more acute, and there's been some great speeches this afternoon with David Torrance and Mary Fee who point this out. We have to get the system right, but it has to be swift. In the government's latest wellbeing survey of young people, 
before the pandemic, 38% of young people reported that they had poor mental well-being, the highest such rate on record, and the pandemic obviously has made that worse. And the drop in referrals to CAMS over the first lockdown was deeply concerning. The most common reason for a referral being rejected was because the condition was not deemed severe enough, and even when children are self-harming. I, I find this quite astonishing. The Mental Health Foundation said that there is an urgent need to put in place special measures to support the mental health and well-being of people aged between 18 and 24. We need to be prepared to make design changes in the light of the pandemic. We need to focus on the critical age group, or if not, the consequences are bleak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Sandra White to be followed by Morris Curry. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and uh, can I thank the, the committee for this report, and I, I really welcome the opportunity to be able to speak in this debate. I know it has been very difficult, uh, obviously, for the petitioner also, and it's taken four years, but I do very much uh, welcome this uh, report, and uh, I thank the committee for looking at it, and obviously the petitioner for the work in bringing this very critical uh, issue to the Parliament. I think everyone you know, has agreed to an extent that, well, they have agreed that good mental health is equally as important as good physical health. And therefore, I, I believe it's right to both assume and assert that the same access to support and services should be comparative between mental health and physical health. But unfortunately, in some of the contributions we've had uh, today, it shows that it's not always the case. And tragically, uh, in the most extreme cases, young lives are, are lost. Uh, the pandemic, which has already been mentioned, and the effects it's had, it's touched everyone, but uh, none more so than our young people. And I have been in dialogue and, and speaking and uh, Zoom meetings with the Samaritans and the Scottish Association for Mental Health to discuss the, the impact on young people of mental health, and obviously with uh, the pandemic, COVID as well. And the particular demographic of my constituency has made me become aware and concerned with students' mental health and how they have coped with the restrictions. Uh, early indication has shown that there has been a, a real worsening of health, mental health issues across the, this younger age group. Uh, there is overwhelming evidence that good mental health and well-being contributes to students' ability to effectively participate, grow in confidence, thrive in, in their studies, but poor mental health can negatively affect students and, and others' learning and their progress and ultimately the outcomes. Now, a first-year college or university student pre-2020 uh, would have had a, a really different experience starting their uh, studies, moving away from home, starting new friendships, going to a new city, being financially independent or just independent even, and all of this has been taken away because of the pandemic. And um, it's, I know the necessary measures that have been put in place, but it has had a real effect on the students, uh, to obviously on their mental health as well. And it, is a, it isn't a surprise, unfortunately, there has been a rise in a number of young people looking for support. The Samaritans have identified through their helpline increased levels of anxiety as well as concerns about mental health, worries about employment, has been mentioned before, finances, and feelings of loneliness and isolation. And the uh, figures show that they have answered almost a million calls uh, for help, with around one in four uh, contacts focusing on concerns about coronavirus. In the recent survey of call handlers, one said, the young people seem to have little hope for the future, what will happen about the university courses or their job. <clears throat> I raised the issue of mental health in the chamber a few weeks ago, seeking assurances that students will have access to support. And I do acknowledge that the Minister for Mental Health response, and I do welcome the action taken by the Scottish Government with the additional 3.6 million uh, for 80 additional councillors. I think Dave Torrance had mentioned that as well, in colleges and universities over the next four years as well as the funding of NUS Scotland to host Think Positive, a student mental health project which supports students experiencing uh, mental uh, health. He's been a bit of a... I, uh, I had asked 
I had asked at this point <clears throat> if the applied suicide intervention skills training, I think Beatrice Wishart had mentioned this too, assist would continue to be accessible. It is a vital component of uh, services offered in providing support. Uh, the evidence offers to show this very effective training program that provides people with skills and confidence to intervene in, in situations. Now, I know the Minister stated at that point, and I believe Beatrice Wishart raised this as well, that it was not being delivered due to the pandemic. I understand that the training obviously is usually face-to-face -face under normal circumstances. However, a number of organisations have had to adapt to meetings such as this. The Parliament has adapted also. And I just wonder if I could ask the Minister for 2012 if the decision to stop the delivery of assist could be looked at again and perhaps provide the training virtually, as we do here in the Parliament and in committees also. I mean, it could provide a really useful and effective way forward, I think, which would bolster our mental health services. Now, I do acknowledge the Scottish Government is taking action, working with professionals, organisations. You see this through the work carried out with the NUS, the Samaritans and SAMH, to name but a few. In fact, I had the opportunity yesterday uh, to attend a meeting with SAMH, and I did discuss his debate that I would be speaking in it. And I know they have engaged with the committee in the inquiry, and I have got a number of asks of the Scottish Government. Uh, perhaps. Uh, Scottish Government could explore uh, exactly what Sam H has raised with the committee and also raised with myself, and perhaps incorporate into the work already being carried out by the Scottish Government, undertaken by the Scottish Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call Maurice Corrie. Maurice Corrie will be the last uh, open debate speaker. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I too am pleased to take part in this debate today as a member of the Public Petitions Committee and along with my colleagues I found exploring the impact of mental health on young people in Scotland to be truly eye-opening and I am very grateful uh, to Annette McKenzie for lodging this petition and also for her strong persistence. Also my thanks go to the clerks of the committee for their hard work too. Through the committee's work I have had the privilege of listening to many people and particularly young people around Scotland who have been amazingly open in sharing their experiences of mental health and what they feel must improve for young people across Scotland. I am sure this report goes some way in highlighting the ways in which the complexities surrounding mental health support can be better addressed without any more delay. Young people can face several pressures, the pressures of schoolwork, exams, family-related issues, bereavement, and the impact of COVID-19 has lifted these burdens to a very dangerous extent. Uncertainties around health, exams, future work opportunities, as well as the potential for bereavement, has heightened feelings of stress and anxiety. But far from being new problems, COVID-19 has served to worsen the ongoing mental health crisis, and that was really plain to see before the pandemic. With a rising number of suicides, increasing waiting times for mental health treatment, and concerning, uh, concerning vacancies numbers for psychiatric services for children, the gaps in mental health support are in dire need of fixing. Therefore, the necessity of establishing mental health support pathways that are widely available and easily accessible has never been more pronounced. And the committee noted a clear need for much clearer and much greater emphasis to be placed on early and proactive intervention Guidance at the... Yes, I will. I thank uh, Maurice Corrie for taking the intervention. And, uh, uh, from the points that he's made there, then I uh, take it that he will be welcoming the establishment of the community wellbeing centres that are um, being rolled out right across the country by local authorities for 5 to 24-year-olds, which will provide a lot of that very um, early intervention and uh, lower level therapeutic interventions that he's talking about. Thank you. Uh, Mr Curry, you will get your time back for the intervention. That's very kind, you, Deputy Prime Officer. Uh, I thank the Minister for that intervention, very valuable intervention. I too, yes, I will totally support that. And I have an interest also for veterans, obviously our early service leaders who fall into the higher end of that age group. And yes, I welcome it very much so. Uh, guidance at the point of need would help to target mental Ill, mentally ill health uh, before it escalates and worsens. But hand in hand with the early intervention must be a more coordinated, partnered approach to mental health support provision. 
a major concern for many young people, often shared by their teachers, uh, pupil support assistants, and on occasions GPs, is knowing which way to turn and how best to navigate mental health support services. Uh, each local area differs in the pathways of support available, with varying degrees of signposting, and the committee learned of the benefits recognised by organisations across the private, public and third sector in working together, a prime example of being placed to be in Ayrshire, particularly in my region. This charity works with schools and the local council to build on resilience by encouraging more open dialogue and developing coping strategies for our young people. However, this joined up approach needs to be more consistently available across the whole of Scotland. And so I certainly agree with the need to build up a network of services furthered by f greater information uh, sharing and integration across the local authorities for the sake of being as transparent and easily accessible as possible for uh, young people and their families. And this obviously has been highlighted by the intervention just now of the Minister, to which obviously I agreed and her points. Of course, families, teachers and GPs play a key part in supporting young people through mental health issues, and this is not without its own pressures. For teachers and GPs especially, the limit of the, on their time to spend with young people has caused concern. Indeed, having the time and space to simply listen cannot be underestimated. And moreover, the committee has also recognised the obligation to ensure parents can also receive training and counselling in how best to support their children through mental ill health. And to conclude, Deputy Designing Officer, young people's mental health and the impact of COVID-19 must be taken seriously. And I hope the Scottish Government will act on these concerns without any further delay. And young people and their families are deserving of the best possible action access to support and for this to happen we must see a greater focus on coordination and early intervention as exemplified by the process that's being followed. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches. We have a little time in hand. I will call Monica Lennon to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the Public Petitions Committee and everyone who contributed to the inquiry and the report. It's been an excellent debate and I welcome the contributions from colleagues right across the, the chamber. Listening to the convener, uh, Joanne Lamont, in her opening remarks, it was heartening to hear that the committee found evidence of good mental health services across the country and strong examples of partnership working. That's really important. And I think it's also really positive that we are, as a country, speaking much more openly about mental health. That has to be welcome too. However, it's clear from the evidence that there are gaps in support that must be filled. And urgent action is needed to ensure that every child and every young person in Scotland receives the right support when they need it and support for their their parents and carers too. That came across really strongly in, in the comments from Joanne Lamont and others. Annette McKenzie has shown great courage in the face of the worst adversity possible. The tragic death of her daughter, Brittany, has clearly, clearly made a mark on the committee members and, and those who have supported Annette and her family. And I think it was right to hear the convener recognise that Annette's petition has been the catalyst for this comprehensive um, committee and in inquiry. Presiding officer, the mental health of young people in Scotland has been a prominent issue in Parliament during my time here. Before COVID, we know that youth campaigners in Scotland described a growing mental health crisis as their generation's epidemic. Long waiting times for mental health treatment are intolerable and urgent action is required to prevent our children and young people falling deeper into mental health crises. And life in lockdown, as we've heard today, is affecting the mental health of people of all ages and from all backgrounds. But for children and young people who maybe don't understand the magnitude of what's been happening and those who have experience direct trauma. It is very, very difficult and the, Min the Minister for Mental Health has acknowledged um, today and, and before that the Scottish Government does anticipate uh, an increase in demand for mental health services. And we've heard from colleagues today, including Beatrice Wishart, the important role that our schools are playing in supporting young people in these difficult times. Now, more than ever, adequate funding for not just the NHS, but also for our vital 
third sector organisations who provide lifeline support are required. We've heard about the importance of, of proper pathways and importantly signposting because I think we all know about examples in our community of really excellent services but how many of our constituents know how to access them at the point of crisis or more importantly before the point of, of crisis. And just as the impact of COVID-19 hasn't just affected businesses, it has hit the voluntary sector hard. Many um, charities haven't been able to, to fundraise. But if I just take a moment to join the Minister in paying tribute to the mental health workforce who have had to adapt enormously during the pandemic. And I welcome her commitment to addressing unacceptably long waits for CAMS, as, as even figures today have highlighted. Um, to also show an area where I think we are beginning to make some progress, I want to thank the Minister for her work recently in bringing opposition spokespeople together with um, experts from charities and also, most importantly, young people with lived experience. And that's on the issue of self-harm, which I don't think this Parliament has addressed uh, enough in recent years, but there is a commitment cross-party to, to do better. I was shocked to learn that one in six young people between the ages of 16 and 24 in Scotland have self-harmed at some point in their lives. And we know that prevalence of self-harm also increases with deprivation. People living in the most deprived areas are more than twice as likely to self-harm than people in, in wealthier areas. And, and I think these, these factors are, are, are true of, of mental health generally. Um, Self-harm is mentioned in almost one in four contacts from under 18 year olds to the Samaritans helpline service. So I'm grateful to the Minister for bringing people together on this issue. Um, it's clear that in this parliament there is a lot of passion to, to get this right for all young people. In terms of some direct commitment, Sam H are asking for each local authority to have a central mental health hub that children and young people are referred to if they need support that is not readily available to them in the community, where they can be quickly assessed by a multidisciplinary team and connected to the support they need without the threat of rejection. I think that's really important. They're also asking for the professionalisation of personal and social education, with mental health education a core part of PSC. And again, I think that's just one example where it shows that it's not just down to one minister to get this right. We need all parts of government working um, together. To pick up on a local example, presiding officer, and the minister will be familiar with the work of FAMS, families affected by murder and suicide. Lanarkshire-based charity founded around seven years ago to support families affected by murder or suicide. They've recently been in touch to say that they are financially vulnerable due to not being able to, to fundraise, but demand for their services is overwhelming. And they say the cost of FAMS closing to the NHS and emergency services could be thousands of pounds in terms of visits to A&E, GPs and so on, but the cost in human terms would be immeasurable. So we need to act because we can't leave a generation of children and young people behind. I was very struck by words by Annette McKenzie, whose daughter Brittany has inspired much of today's debate. Annette said that Brittany's beautiful smile had a world of pain. Her smile could brighten up the darkest of days, just not her own. And as we think about building back better after COVID, we need to build back kinder. So I'll finish with Annette's words, presiding officer. She said, reach out to all your friends tonight. Let them know you love them and are glad for them in your life and you are here for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Jamie Green to be followed by Claire Hawking. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been a really uh, interesting debate. I'm pleased that all members have taken part constructively. Um, although we have made some punchy points, which I'll reflect on in my summing up, I'd like to thank the committee for its work in this report. Uh, my thanks, too, also go to Annette McKenzie, who has become a strong and courageous campaigner for young people's mental health and the catalyst for this report. And I was really struck by the mantra on her social media, and she said, it's easier to build strong children than broken adults. Uh, how, how right she is. I'm working on this Parliament's redress for survivors of historic sexual abuse bill, and I've heard some first-hand experience of survivors who were broken children who became strong adults. So there is hope. 
In the context of COVID, this report is timely and much needed. You know, we have a virus on our hands which is harmful to our physical health, to that of older people and our vulnerable uh, people, but equally harmful to the mental health of young people who have been disproportionately affected by the secondary impacts of this lockdown. Their loss of social interaction, loss of jobs, being cooped up in the house, often with their parents, not being able to see their friends, and also a, a tragic rise in online bullying and the stress of social media, a lack of sports, a lack of hobbies, and of course, a lack of access to support uh, and much needed medical care. And all that support has often moved online or on the telephone, and for too often and too many, simply being prescribed medication on repeat with no face-to-face -face catch up, no face-to-face counselling. And we know this is now the norm for far too many young people. And it's not because GPs don't want to help, but it's because they've only got 15 minutes. And it's a waiting list of months for CBT, for talking therapy and other forms of intervention. And many of the other things that young people used to do to self-help, self-help, hobbies, coffee with a friend, volunteering work, work itself, education, for too many that's all gone now too. And this goes far beyond just anecdotal, the data speaks for itself. According to the Samaritans, the suicide rate amongst young people is the highest it's been since 2007. Another report tells us that one in nine young people in Scotland have attempted suicide. That's one in nine young people. You think about that when we do our visits uh, to schools or colleges, that in a group of people, one in nine will have attempted self, uh, suicide and one in six self-harm, a point that Monica uh, Lennon made. And amongst the LGBTI community, those numbers are even higher. Now, I personally know throughout this pandemic, I've already lost two friends uh, in my network uh, just in the last three months. I know that because they, they popped up in my Facebook uh, and you see it, uh, and it's another month and another lost. And each of those were still surrounded by so much stigma and taboo, which is why this report needs to be taken seriously by us all. I don't say this lightly, but I believe that the physical health emergency that we are now nine months into is going to lead to a mental health emergency that will last for years. A mental health emergency that we have not seen the likes of before and which sadly we are woefully underprepared for and it's simply too early to work out how this emergency will manifest itself but let me say just as we equip our nurses with PPE we need to equip our teachers with the skills to spot the signs and support those who need help and as this report recommends and as many have said in the debate today that work must start now in fact it should have already started already because those sad statistics speak for themselves. Now, the report talks about the confusing and cluttered landscape for accessing support, and that, I think that gets to the heart of the matter. The pathways to get support are not always clear. They're not always just unclear. They're often not there at all. We know that the NUS study found that a third of students did not go uh, know where to go for support. And when they do go for support, what happens? They're facing lengthy and unacceptable waits, even just for that first vital assessment never mind ongoing treatment. And I don't mean weeks, in many cases months, and in some cases over a year. A year just to see somebody. How can that be acceptable to any of us? I know the minister takes this seriously, but we talk the talk in here about mental health. We talk that it has equity of importance as physical health, but does it really? We'd believe someone with a severe physical disease diagnosed nine months before they see a consultant. Well, in some cases we do. But there would be outrage in this parliament over that. So where is the outrage? Where is that same outrage over mental health support? Let this debate serve as a stark warning to us all. It must be the catalyst for a renewed overhaul of our approach to supporting young people's mental health. With a support mechanism and a focus on community-led, bottom-up approaches, mental health first aid training for our teachers, opportunities for teacher professional uh, development. We know school counsellors will play a vital role. We must meet that target of having them in every school. Every school must have access to one. We know there is a workforce crisis uh, within uh, uh, providing uh, uh, mental health support. We know that because the Royal College of Psychiatrists warned us of this. We know that there are huge vacancies uh, in consultancy posts, uh, posts and we must question ourselves why is that and what has been done about it, and I hope the Minister will reflect on the recruitment issue uh, in, in summing up. Um, 
I, I, just in my last moment, but I, I would, would, would like you to address that. Now, I can't, just in closing, take part in this debate without addressing the substance of the petition itself, because it's an important and grave issue. The complex issue of where the parents or guardians should be informed about a mental health diagnosis or the prescription of medication. It is hugely complex. I don't have the answer. I don't have teenage children with depression who are taking medication or who are self-harming. But would I want to know if they'd been prescribed medication? I probably would. And if nothing else, just to ensure consistency of adherence to their treatment plan. But do I also think they have a right to privacy as young adults? Just as I would not interfere in their contraception or sexual health or other personal health issues, well, that too. Because if there is someone vulnerable out there and their GP uh, says so, then the moral question is whether or not their guardians should be informed. However that is dealt with, that is a conundrum yet to be resolved. But we, what we do know is that we cannot let these young people down a day longer. Every loss of life, every act of self-harm, every day of darkness they face, if we can prevent it, we must. And if we don't, I argue that will be a shameful legacy of our shared time in this parliament. We can do better, we have to do better. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Claire Hockey, uh, an equally generous uh, six minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thank you to the members for this thoughtful and constructive debate, which has addressed many important issues this evening. And again, th I thank the committee for their work and for their report. As Minister for Mental Health, I am reassured that there is a clear consensus that the mental health of our young people is of paramount importance and that we as a country must continue to do more to make sure children and young people have the support that they need. We must work together to ensure that our mental health is cared for and talked about as equally and as openly as our physical health is. And that is as true from perinatal and infant mental health all the way through to the mental health of older people. As I mentioned at the start of this debate, COVID-19 has brought new and significant challenges into everyone's day-to-day -day life. And it has changed life as we know it and has taken away many of the comforts that we rely on so heavily. The usual things that we might do to improve our mental well-being, such as visiting friends, going to the gym, they've been taken away from us and alternatives have to be found. This pandemic will undoubtedly have a substantial impact on the mental health and well-being of our population for some time to come. However, we continue to strive to provide the best possible mental health care and support for Scotland's children and young people, including those who support them, particularly their families and carers. The actions within our transition and recovery plan set out how we are going to do that as we continue to live with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and hopefully as we move towards the successful development and distribution of a vaccine. The experiences that members across the chamber and beyond have shared today have been honest and telling. I'm sure that each of us as constituency MSPs and as members of communities have heard personal accounts of the mental health challenges faced by children and young people across Scotland. It's those stories and experiences that drive me to keep working to improve services, to improve access to CAMS, to develop alternative services for those who would benefit from support in the community and to ensure that every young person in Scotland can access high quality information to support their mental health and well-being. Before this debate is closed, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our key partners, some of whom have been mentioned in the debate today, and particularly third sector organisations across Scotland. You have shown absolute resilience through the most trying of times to ensure that local services and support are still available to our children and young people. I'm sure that members will join me in recognising your hard work and commending you for all your support over the last nine months and beyond. And similarly, thank you again to our young people of Scotland. I hope future generations never have to experience challenges like those you have to face through this pandemic. But I'm also aware that the repercussions of COVID-19 will be felt for years to come. And it's extremely important that we remember that that when the virus is no longer with us itself, the indirect effects of it will remain for some time. During this debate, presiding officer, we've heard many interesting and thought-provoking points that were raised by members, and I'd like to address a few of those, if I may. Uh, Mary Fee asked for an update on school counsellors. 
Um, we are on course to invest £60 million so that every high school has access to counselling. Our local authority partners made excellent progress during the school closures and plans indicated that they were on course to deliver by the end of October. My officials are currently confirming this position with authorities and we will report on that in due course. Um, Jamie Green um, raised the issue of workforce. We are supporting a Scottish Government, the Royal College of Psychiatry's programme Choose Psychiatry, um, which aims to encourage medical graduates to work in the field of mental health, and we will continue to do that. Joanne Lamont um, raised mental health training. Um, we have a range of training materials, including online resources provided by NEST, which are available to all staff working with children and young people currently. Um, Sandra White and Beatrice Wisher raised the issue of assist, and I know I have answered um, in chamber a question from uh, Sandra White about assist. Um, it, is a, it is quite complex, and so I am happy to commit to writing to both Sandra White and uh, Beatrice Wisher, um, explaining why that cannot be delivered online currently, um, and give them a full explanation of that. And uh, Polly McNeill raised um, quite concerning issues um, about constituency cases. Um, she also raised the issue of CAMS um, using Near Me, and CAMS is actually one of the highest mental health users of Near Me. Mental health services right across the country have been using and adapted to using Near Me quite remarkably over recent months. Um, but in the case of CAMS, sometimes video consultations are not always appropriate um, for the reasons of digital exclusion, safeguarding and others. However, we will continue to work with our CAMS colleagues and uh, try to address uh, digital issues where that is appropriate. President Officer, I would finally like again to thank the Public Petitions Committee for their dedication to the inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland and for requesting this debate. And I'd like to thank the petitioner, Annette McKenzie, for her drive and for her determination, something that was so evident when I met her as someone who has lost a child too. Um, I can only express my admiration for the work that she's done. Um, as we near the end of 2020, it's fair to say that this year mental health has been discussed more than it ever has. We have routinely checked in with friends, family, family and colleagues to ensure that they are feeling and coping okay and have been putting the mental health of others and each other first. I'm thankful for that and it's something that I hope continues far beyond this year. Thank you very much. I now call on Gail Ross to wind up the debate on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Uh, Gail Ross, you have until 6.25. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also add my thanks to everyone that has been involved in the inquiry and the production of this report, especially our committee clerks. I think it's a strong report with recommendations that have to be taken seriously. But I thank the Minister for her consideration and that of the Scottish Government. I also note that other members have also put on record their thanks to her for listening and engaging cross-party on this issue. I have no doubt that she cares deeply about this subject and will continue to commit herself and her team to the young people of Scotland. Also, thanks to all the speakers and what has been a particularly challenging and sometimes emotional discussion today. I'm glad to hear that everyone agrees with our report's recommendations as well. As the convener said during her opening remarks, and as many other speakers have alluded to as well, we are here because of the courage of Annette McKenzie. And despite her grief and pain, she has campaigned for change, aiming to help other young people and their families. While the committee recognises the concerns that have been raised about the specific action originally called for in her petition, I really hope that Annette feels proud that this debate is taking place today, in no small part because of what she started with her petition. Now, in relation to that petition, Brian Whittle spoke about the capacity of young people to make decisions about their own treatment, especially given the petitioner's situation, and Jamie Green addressed this issue as well. 
both agree that there is no easy solution to this. And I think we really struggled with that as a committee as well. And many members who have spoken highlight the need for better access to mental health support, especially, or more importantly, at the point that young people need it the most. But we know that sometimes starting a conversation about mental health is not easy and we need to try and change that. And as we recognise in our report, the impact of COVID-19 and how it's likely to impact on mental well-being uh, will without question lead to an increase in demand for mental health services over and above what we've already seen. And a few speakers, Mary Fee, Brian Whittle, Tom Mason, Morris Corey, Monica Lennon, amongst others, all spoke about the need for joined up services and a more streamlined approach. And I think as a committee, we agreed with that as well. Presiding officer, to inform our report, we undertook extensive external engagement and we really are grateful to all of those who met with us. The experience of the young people, their families and friends, the professionals who are doing all that they can to support them was absolutely critical to our understanding of how young people are currently able to access support for their mental health. And as many people said, the committee is particularly grateful to the young people who took the time to meet with us and share their sometimes painful experiences. Their voices have been central to the shaping of our report and by extension this debate, which is to improve the support available, increase access to it and to tackle the stigma of mental health. Now, Monica Lennon, spoke about stigma in her speech and how we really need to get through that in order to give people the support they need. And she's absolutely correct. We have come far, but we still have a long way to go. We want to empower young people so that they can have more awareness and ultimately more agency with their own mental health. Around this time last year, I, along with my then committee member, Brian Whittle, had the privilege of meeting a group of young people in parliament and they were really honest and frank about their experiences and the support that they had received from teachers, school staff, but also from third sector organisations working with the skills. And I know that a number of members have said how important it is that we had the debate beforehand as well about the importance of the third sector. But what I was struck by was how important it is, and they told us this, about the access to the right support at the right time and also the importance of knowing how to express yourself and to make yourself understood so that you can ask for help more effectively. Presiding officer, as a committee, we have seen firsthand the good intentions and the commitment of all those in healthcare and educational settings, of those in third sector organisations and those in national and local government to support people with their mental health. But our evidence shows that where things are working well, this could be shared more widely, and that those working with young people could be equipped with better resources and training, and that discussions about mental health and possible avenues for support need to be more open and accessible. But we did recognise that although much is being done, it's often not enough. Now, we heard about early intervention programmes such as Let's Introduce Anxiety Management in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but its success depends on being used at the earliest stages of anxiety. So it is concerning that in many areas there is a waiting list for this programme. And in Highland Region, challenges with recruitment result in similar situations with long waiting lists and young people struggling to be heard. Many members if not everyone that spoke, also highlighted the need for training, especially in specialist services like CAMS, given the huge waiting list that some areas face. And I thank the Minister for recognising this in her remarks, and I welcome the actions to help boards with particularly long waiting times. I, like Maurice Corey, also welcome the creation of the wellbeing centres by local authorities across the country, and let me also echo the Minister's thanks to every single person working in mental health at the moment. We owe you a huge debt of gratitude for all that you're doing. David Torrance's speech was powerful in pointing out how important it is for young people in so many aspects of life to have good mental health. 
He also spoke about challenging stigma and living in a Scotland where we prioritise mental health, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Tom Mason noted the rise in mental health issues and the increased use of social media. And I know that this is something that other members have spoken about in other debates. Sandra White mentioned the Samaritans and Sam H and all the good work that they do. And she mentioned the asks that both organisations have and asked that they be incorporated into the current Scottish Government work programme. Maurice Corey also noted the pressures that young people currently face. He mentioned the worrying rise of suicide in young people, and I know that this is something that worries us all. Jamie Green reminded us of GPs that are under immense pressure with only 15 minutes per appointment. He painted a bleak picture of the statistics of self-harm and suicide, particularly in the LGBTI community. And he told us how he has personally lost friends. And I can't imagine how difficult this must be, so I thank him for telling us about that. It has been recognised by all speakers the likely impact the COVID-19 public health emergency will have on our mental as well as our physical health. Beatrice Wisher noted the challenges to health and well-being due to the interruption to education and also the inability of the current mental health system to cope. She also spoke about the importance of training and access to help and also the big role that education plays in this help. Holly McNeil also spoke of the impact of lockdown and how this is affecting our young people. She recounted a distressing situation with someone that has been let down by services and attempted to take their own life and pointed out the discrepancies in some areas between the services that can be accessed. Mary Fee and Sandra White rightly spoke about students and feelings of loneliness and isolation. But, as it was pointed out, this issue has been around long before COVID, albeit that this has and will exacerbate the situation. While we do not know yet the full extent of the longer-term impact of this crisis, we do know that the challenges facing many young people, such as disruption to their education, and the employment opportunities available to this particular age group have been significant. Presiding officer, as a committee, we acknowledge that meaningful work and commitment to improve mental health support for young people was already underway by the Scottish Government before our report was published. What our report shows, however, is that more needs to be done. The impact of COVID-19 will only compound that situation as a parliament, it is our duty to ensure our young people have the best possible support for their mental health. And in conclusion, I would absolutely echo Monica Lennon's words. Get in touch with somebody, phone them, ask them how they're doing, tell them that you love them. Presiding officer, I support the motion in Joanne Lamont's name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Ross. That concludes the debate on an inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland in the name of the Public Petitions Committee. And we will move on now to the next item of business, uh, which is decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 23408.1 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, which seeks to amend Motion 23408. 23408 in the name of Ruth Maguire on valuing the third sector be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Thank you very much. The second question is that uh, the mo motion 23408 in the name of Ruth Maguire as amended on valuing the third sector be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The third question uh, is that uh, the uh, motion 23498 in the name of Joanne Lamont on the in an inquiry into mental health support for young people in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. We will move on in a moment to the next item of business. And can I remind members uh, to leave the chamber, uh, when leaving the chamber, to observe the uh, uh, social distancing requirements that are in place. Thank you very much. <laughs>